Thank you, uh, Professor Yumeni. Thank you for your invitation. Um, it's my great honor to be invited and come here to teach this class. You know, uh, I'm uh, teaching in, uh, development and cultural relations in our university. We also have uh, a similar uh, program. Our program is called Development in Cultural Relations. We have about 100 students here, you know, uh, double more than we have. And also, our students come from all over the world. Uh, we also have uh, a double degree program uh, where we have uh, collaboration with the University of International Relations in Beijing. So they come 12 students to us, stay one year, the next year they come back and 12 students from our side also follow to Beijing. So uh, after two years they get uh, both degrees from China and also uh, uh, all. Uh, my research is uh, on uh, IR international relations and international political economy and my major focus in the last 10 years is on the rise of China and impact on the global order. As you many talk about my uh, edited books that uh, in 2010, uh, the first book on the rise of China and the capitalist world order in 2012, uh, the rise of China and semi-periphery and periphery countries. And this is a big topic today as well. Uh, third one is China and African relations. And the fourth is the BRICS uh, during the, uh, you know, uh, seven, six, seven years ago, the break was a big topic. Okay. Then uh, emerging power and emerging market. Uh, then, the, the, then the topic of emerging power. Okay. It's a big topic. Then uh, the end of the last year, I added a book on One Belt, One Road, which I, I'm going to mention on this, on this lecture. Then the uh, international political economy of the BRICS. And now, very soon, in about two months, uh, another book is the China Latin American Relations will be published, uh, where that uh, group of Latin American scholars uh, um, uh, write in their articles on China. So you can see that, uh, that I very much focus on the rise of China impact on the global order, uh, which is a big topic today. Uh, this semester, I have been invited to six countries and to both lectures and conferences, especially conferences where they set up a special panel um, the rise of China impact and put me in debate with other audience. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to sit there being attacked all the time, you see. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not fun, but uh, it's, it's okay. Um, I try to be objective, as objective as possible. So my topic today is about, uh, is about the China's global rise impact on the existing world order with a focus on Europe. Okay, and Europe is not my uh, expertise, but I, since I live in Europe, I work in Europe, so at least I know something about Europe. Um, what I, I'm going to do is I go through some kind of uh, historical trajectory of European development and also point out some of the complexities that Europe is facing today. And I move to the rest of China, which adds even more impact and complexity to Europe. And to make Europe really to rethink, because Europe now is in a very critical period. And uh, I want to start by side, I think you all are aware that uh, Macron, that uh, uh, this summer, I think, I think this summer, June, he collects all these his French ambassadors, uh, the foreign, foreign diplomats, French foreign diplomats, and, and gather in the conference, and he talk about, he make a long speech, and where, his main argument, sorry, his main argument is the end of Western hegemony. When he said this, it was a big shock that uh, none of the Western leaders dare to say this, that now we are in an age that Western uh, hegemony is ending. So, so the Western hegemony consists of the French hegemony, cultural hegemony, the British industrial hegemony, and American military hegemony. So this three hegemony has made West last Western hegemony last for 700 years, and now it's declining. And he mentioned a lot about China, and hardly about Russia, in India, and the BRICS, but mainly on China. Okay. So China is a big uh, kind of topic. And if you look at, and also he mentioned about, on the one hand, that this declining of Western hegemony 
was also accelerated by the withdrawal of the United States leadership. Okay, so he actually not condemned, but he criticized violently against the U.S. withdrawal of its obligations. At the same time, he also said China, even though China is pushing the world into multilateralism, but still China is trying to set up the world order which in line of China's hegemony. So, so, so what, then what should Europe do? Okay. Europe is facing a lot of problems. Europe now is having great difficulty in Atlantic relations with the United States, I would mention Brexit from the UK. Now you have a big big problem with Turkey. Okay. Turkey has been applying for membership, European membership, never been admitted. I told you I told my friend in, in Turkey they don't want you. So forget it. They, they still want to apply to the it's my conviction. I asked my colleague, European colleague, and they told me that, that, that uh, Turkey is not Europe. And asked me, how about Russia? Russia is not Europe either. So I'm very confused that, uh, to me, I think Russia is Europe. Turkey perhaps not, but uh, even Russia is not Europe. There's a lot of, a lot of debates here. Then you can see that uh, with, uh, with Syria, with Iran, with, uh, with Israel, you know, that uh, Europe is much more sympathetic uh, sympathetic to Palestinian and much more critical towards Israel, but Israel was much more defended by the United States. And you also have uh, this uh, North Korea issue. Okay. Now, and NATO, uh, that the French president uh, not long ago said that the NATO brain is dead. This is also a shock, a big shock to many uh, <laughs> European leaders. And, and, and the European Union's China relationship is very controversial, I will mention to you a lot. And also Europe's relation with the BRICS is also very controversial. So you can see, I try to present that uh, Europe is having a lot of complexities today. Okay. Then, when we talk about international order, okay, when, when, when I said that the rise of China and impact on international order, what is international order? Well, international order to me, if you study uh, mainstream, international order, is that international order actually is the European order. And to start with uh, 1948, the Treaty of Westphalia. Anyone tell me what is the Westphalia Treaty? Anyone? Yes? Yes, so it marked the what, what, the, what this order mean? As, uh, there are some key words, okay. So national states between the prior... Yes, good, and? Sovereignty, yes. The emergence of the nation states. Yes. And uh, that all the nation states will be respecting the similarity of other states. Yes. And it's been like, marked as, um, as a historical event where um, where all the countries were like, uh, okay. they had to respect the independence of other states and instead of intervention. Yeah, respect of sovereignty and non-interference. Okay, this is the major principle. Then, how about the Congress Vienna? What is Congress Vienna? Who? This is international order. This is the order. Come on! It's one of the main events in the, the mid the 19th century with the after the Napoleon War. Good. <coughs> yeah, the end of the Napoleon War, where that uh, the Europe reached a new kind of uh, international consensus. How about the Versailles Conference? It was uh, almost um, in the conference and uh, it was decided to make a, a international organization to... Uh, which, after which event? After the World War. Yeah. After the, yeah. first, the First World War, yes. Yeah. Yeah. After the First World War, the military power said that together they tried to redivide the world. At the same time, they need to punish Germany, okay? Then, how about the Brand War system? That should be very well known to everyone, okay? That's the Second World War. After the Second World War, the United States established what we call the international, what we call the US led international order, that is the one, okay? Then, in 2008, when the, when the, uh, since the financial crisis started, and people say that the uh, world began to enter into a new, uh, new uh, stage, okay? So actually, the history of international order, by definition, is the history of Europe, actually. Okay. And uh, 
Because you know why? Why in that order is all that Europe always joked that Europe actually, if you look at European history, is a history of wars and history of killings more than any other continent in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I'm, I'm fair to say that. I don't know whether Professor Pimamani is against me or not. But anyway, if you read the European history, it's really fast. Okay. But now, because too many wars, that the European Union's objective is to avoid war forever. Okay. This is, uh, I think, uh, one of the ideas. And then, as, then after the Second World War, that the United States established what we call the global order or world order. It has mainly four pillars. One is the Brandwood institutions. Okay. The second is NATO. It is what we call security alliance. The third one is Euro-Asia uh, uh, Euro global trade network. The fourth is the, what we call the liberal value, American trade. These are the four pillars of the Why I need to point this is because the rise of China is challenging all of this. Okay, this is what but we need to understand what is the pillar, what are the pillars of the international order first. Okay. And I, I give a diagram which help you to understand. One of my characteristics of lecture is that I use more diagrams and, and drawings rather than words. So uh, students in my program like my teaching very much. Uh, I hope you also like it, but anyway, I uh, try my best to make a drawing. Uh, this is an order where US is in the middle, okay? We have a, an economic order, we have a political order, which is also referred to security order. The United States provides public goods. So during the long period, the United States play a role of, during that whole day, play a role, okay, which means that play a global role. But today, it's the reverse that the uh, United States is uh, global unilateralism. Globally become unilateralism. So here it's a, it's a different world today. But so United States actually maintain hegemonic stability. That's, the, that's the one of the biggest theories, okay. And in order to, um, right after the, the, uh, the brand wood system uh, order, that uh, then we had this, uh, the United States moved to Europe quickly and the Marshall Plan uh, assisted Europe and also military aid assist East Asia. Why the United States invest on these two regions? Europe, Western Europe and East Asia. Why? Marshall Plan towards Europe, military aid towards East Asia. Why? Yes. Or uh, East Asia might be is one of the centers of production, and uh, at that time, and moreover, uh, Japan is uh, a strategic uh, has a strategic yeah, strategic position dislocation in uh, this region. And when you when you talk about uh, that East Asia has a strategic position in terms of what? In terms of U.S. In terms of what? Uh, for U.S. and in terms of uh, controlling. Uh, more time. Well, at that time, we don't forget the Cold War, okay? So, Cold War, that the, the capitalist war system has two big enemies. One is Russia, oh, sorry, at that time, the beginning one is China, okay? Where was Russia located? In Europe, of course. Then, the United States had to support Western Europe in order to resist the expansion of Russia. East Asia, China, okay? So, these two regions, Western Europe and East Asia, they were the front lines of Cold War. That's why the United States had to support these two regions. And, uh, and also the United States, through Marshall Plan, through aid, military aid, is able to internationalize the US dollar as the key currency, despite the fact that the US and gold are packed at that, were packed at that time, okay? But still US, through Marshall Plan, also help to internationalize the dollar, okay? And also, after the Second World War, when the war ends, how about United States industry? The United States produced almost every commodity during the war period, especially the weapon, but after the war, what, how about those industrial capacities? They cannot just be abandoned, 
Okay, so they moved to Europe as well. So you can see that uh, some of the rationalities you would be surprised to find very similar to China's one belt one road. I will mention to you later about China's one belt one road. Okay. But it's different historical background, but some rationalities is there. Then, the United States also has to uh, institution, ins institutionalize the security system in Europe, NATO. Okay? So we have, uh, at that time, we have Warsaw Pact which is uh, the socialist bloc of security alliance we have, we have we have here NATO okay but NATO is in crisis today starting the crisis of Georgia and now Ukraine okay so NATO's uh, reputation is really in crisis as well now actually Turkey is behaving also very strangely in in the Middle East and and the one country which I admire, I admire, and many European countries admire, is Finland. Okay. Finland has a long border with Russia. Finland said, I do not want to join NATO. So if you ask Russia, Russia never regards Finland as a threat, because Finland voluntarily chose not to be a member of NATO. Because if you are not a member of NATO, then Russia regards the Eastern Front front line as not much more peaceful. This is what we call the security dilemma theory. theory. This is what Merchenhammer, the, uh, the key author of, the key scholar of realism today, he said that security dilemma, which means that if a country A tries to strengthen itself by investing in military, then country B regard that as kind of evil intention. So country B began to also buy more military equipment. But when country B tried to buy more military equipment, that confirms country A's perception. Oh my God, see, country B is really preparing now. So I will be in trouble. So country, country A is going further to invest. So this is what I call, what the theory called security dilemma spirit. So when you move to Russians, Frontier area, Russian will react. And this is Moshe Hammer's point. He said that uh, it was a mistake of the West or NATO to enlarge towards Russia's border. So this was a mistake. Now, from his point of view, okay, then, then this is not my point of view. But the, the liberal, of course, the new liberal, they do not agree with that. And now we are in a situation where NATO as a transatlantic group is also in crisis. First, that uh, Trump think that uh, every little country is taking advantage of the United States. Okay, every, every uh, Trump, even mm -hmm. every country, um, you know Trump the world, he always said, he even said every Chinese student is a spy today. So he said he's a very, he's a, and, and you can see that a list of little countries' uh, investments so he actually think that uh, that every little country should increase their uh, budget. When you increase your budget, what does that mean? You are going to buy more American weapons. This is very clear. Okay. And now the uh, United States is uh, increasingly uh, pushing Japan and Korea to buy to increase their budget as well. Korea pay about 900 million every year, but Trump wants Korea pay. 5 billion today. Okay, so the negotiation was, was held last week. It was broken. Now, now Japan, Japan said no. Japan also said no. So the, both, the two small brothers said no to the United States. Okay. And also, uh, and uh, Macron uh, recently said that the uh, US withdrawal from Syria war uh, without even consulting with the NATO. NATO is green debt. This is a very surprisingly a big statement. And also that uh, Europe and United States transatlantic relations already since the uh, Iraqi war 2003 already kind of a big departure between the relationship. I remember at that time, at, at that time you were much more smaller. At that time three countries voted for the uh, United States. In Europe, okay, I think it's, it's the UK, it's 
Spain and, 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 and Denmark. Okay. So and also the rest of the European countries no, they don't support French even France even wants to veto the United Nations uh, uh, Security Council's uh, resolution. And also you can see that uh, that uh, uh, Europe and, and the United States had a lot of disagreement today. Um, Iran nuclear, uh, Israel Palestine issues, on uh, Saudi issues, on uh, Syria Syria war issues, special refugee issues. Okay, and when Syria was having wars, and the, where where did the refugee go? They go to Europe. They didn't go to the United States. Unfortunately. So, so you can see that, that that this transatlantic relationship is also getting much more complex today than before. Look at here. This here. See? There's a lot of things happening, as, uh, and also that uh, when uh, when Brexit took place, that in Europe we were very kind of feeling not very good, and our colleagues, my colleagues from the UK, they also they did not feel very good. So Trump said that's a good idea. Okay. Trump even said that forget Europe, just leave it. They want the UK, uh, no, just forget them. This is not a moral man. So anyway, that um, and also populism. Don't forget that uh, the rising populism. Populism is a very serious issue in, in, in Italy. Uh, luckily, not that much in Northern Europe, but much become much more popular in in Southern Europe. Okay. So you can see that transatlantic relations is really damaged. And I give you uh, after class, uh, Professor Bumani can give a copy of this to you uh, in PDF file. And you can see the list. I give you the list of international treaties that the United States has withdrawn or on the process of withdrawing or considered withdrawing or threatened. Withdraw. So I have given you a list, okay. And also uh, another major event uh, to be taken place during the G7 meeting this year is that the EU or the, the other G7 members they invited the foreign minister of Iran to be uh, to have a, a, a meeting with with G7 apart from the United States. And uh, the uh, the reporters. The journalist asked Trump why you could not uh, be there. Then he said, oh, sorry, this is not, not another issue. Uh, then uh, the United States was very upset for this because the other members had a meeting with Iran, foreign minister, without even informing the United States. Another meeting is on environment, where that, uh, that uh, Trump refused to attend. But then the reporter asked me why you couldn't just be Attend the the, uh, the, uh, the meeting on Iran uh, on uh, on environment. And he said that he was uh, he was uh, talking to uh, uh, German German uh, Chancellor Merkel, but Merkel was in, in the meeting. That was open line. Okay. So so a lot of uh, things happening uh, recently. Uh, the United States formally withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So leaving China alone as the signature. Uh, I hope China continues to, to keep its promise. Okay, um, I hope so. But I believe China will. I think. And also Russia, and uh, you know that uh, Russia is a big uh, issue. Uh, I was in the Riga conference uh, last month. You know, uh, every year uh, there is a conference in Riga where major European leaders gathered. I was invited there, and uh, for the, the next year. Uh, the Latvia Prime Minister uh, gave an open speech. His whole his speech was about the Russian threat. Oh my God! Those the body countries they were so afraid of Russia. Everything about Russia bad, 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 bad. So you can see a lot. But how about how about Western Europe relation relation with Russia? Yes, uh, Crimea, Eastern, the, the, then the European country they began to have sanctions. But today, actually, everybody wants to lure Russia. Uh, Trump, he, he insisted that, that Russia should be back to G7. Okay. Russia was part of the G8. Okay. G8 was a new invention. Historically, there was only G7. Why there was a G8? Any student know this story? Why? 
Russia became a G8. Yes? No, because it joined up to the fall of the USSR. So it joined the G7. Yeah, but when you are USSR collapsed, why you need to be part of the G7? Since Russia is the successor of the USSR official one. This is a war. This is a, you know, being member of the G8 is a war. A reward, okay? Reward for what? Trying to cooperate with the West. Yeah, well, on that. As a Russian, you know, transformed from a communist dictatorship to what? Democracy. And that needs to be a war. Okay, so it was actually because of democracy bad democracy and to, to the Chinese they, they, they dislike this type of democracy where suddenly you went from one direction to another direction which the country was almost blessed but um, the membership of, of G8 was a reward at, at least okay but that you can see that uh, that now that the uh, Russia was expelled from G8 because of Crimea okay but now John Trump said we should get Russia back and also, French, French uh, President Macron, he flew to Russia and met Putin, and he said, your future lies in Europe. Big arm open. Your future lies in Europe. But when, when Crimea started, Russia was fed. Okay. So you can see it's a, a lot, but how about Putin, whether Putin wants to be part of a G8, you know, he, he, he has no interest at all because Russia's position today was much better, is much better than previous. And, the, and, and the Putin said, well, G7 without India and China, that doesn't mean anything. So he doesn't, he, he's, he has no interest at all. Okay, so far about, I tried to present a variety of complexities facing Europe. Now I'm moving. I'm moving to the key part of this lecture, which is the rise of China. Okay. Napoleon, we just talked about Napoleon. Okay. Napoleon in, uh, in 1803, when he led his army to uh, attack uh, Russia at that time, he told his army officers that if we follow this road, okay, continue this road, will we will reach East Asia. In East Asia, there was a big giant. For China, but that country was in a static situation, was sleeping. That country, but don't touch it. Let us sleep. If you touch it and if you wake it up, the whole world will be shaken. Today, international relations always cite, we quote Napoleon's word. This is what he said. Okay. So you can see that uh, in many years ago, um, uh, the economists had this cartoon. China is awake. It's, it's, it's awake now. When China is awake, the whole world, you know, when, when someone is going to wake, is awake. Someone need breakfast, need lunch, need dinner. Okay. So every every country, the whole world is feeding China with everything. It's not enough. It's simply too big. Okay. So you can see that uh, the GDP in current price, the United States uh, is uh, still largest. Second is. And second is China, but in, the, in terms of the PPP, purchase power parity. Today, international uh, World Bank, IMF, they tend to use PPP as a measure because that gives a much more accurate picture. Um, because when you, when you earn, let's say, 5,000 US dollars, uh, 10,000 US dollars a year in New York, you could not even survive. But if you earn ten thousand US dollar in a city, not Beijing, Shanghai, but a city in, in China, you could live very rich. So it's a, it's the it's the price of commodities should should matter more, not the current exchange price. So if you look at the PPP, then China is the largest economy in the world. So I give you a list of Chinese. Uh, Impact today, or the you can see that uh, about 500 million people are poverty during the three decades, and much many of them march into 
uh, uh, middle class. Okay. If you look at the single day, November 11, I don't know whether you have to buy anything from Alibaba. I hope you buy. Okay. One minute, the, the volume is larger than many countries' GDP. It's huge. Just one minute. Okay. So the purchase power is huge. Average growth is 9 to 10 percent. Today, it's the large economy, the largest trading nation, okay, and also the largest foreign currency reserve, which means China has a lot of money in the bank because of the trade surplus. Okay. And these are the issues, I'm not going to go around each of them, but I simply list these are the issues which become a global debate today, which become a global issue. Everybody is debating about these issues, okay. But I will touch some of the points. The greatest impact of China is made in China model. I think if you open any computer or whatever, maybe not this, everything you know, it says made in China. Sometimes I try to buy some gifts from Denmark to, to back to China. And if you do not really care read really carefully, everything is made in China anyway. So when you buy gifts from Denmark to, to China, it's made in China. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's everything made in China. So what, is, what is made in China? But uh, made in China is changing. I will tell you what is changing. Made in China is that China in the middle. Inputs, you have technologies, in, uh, what I mean in the last, the last 30 years, technologies, equipment, high, some kind of high tech components from Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Then you have materials from Africa, from Australia from ASEAN countries, okay, and then you have a financial support from Singapore and from Hong Kong. They gathered in China, produced in China, then they sent, then they export to Europe, to the United States, to the rest of the world. That is within China model for almost four decades. But now it's changing. Because of changing, it creates China-US trade war, I will tell you. Okay. This is Chinese model, and uh, you can see here is the data. In 1995, every country in East and Southeast Asia had Japan as the largest economic partner. But this picture suddenly changed. Since 2012, every country in East and Southeast country, uh, 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 East and Southeast Asia countries have China as the largest economic partner. Today. 126 countries all over the world have China as the largest economic partner, trade partner. Only 66 countries have the United States as the largest partner. So the world is changing. But the United States still is the country that most countries have security lines, military lines. So that come, now we are, we are facing the challenges, security, and economic benefit. Okay. For, for many countries, it's a very, very difficult choice. <coughs> but this Made in China model creates what, we, what I call deep industrialization in the north and the deep industrialization in the south. Deep industrialization means that since China is so cheap to produce, so since China can produce everything much cheaper, better quality. Why we have to, why we have to uh, produce? So in the last 30 years, in Western Europe, not so much in Italy, but especially in, in, in the United States, most industries move to China. Most industries move to China. Trump, he said, made in the United States, he wants to US company back after 30, 30 years. It's very difficult. Okay. So you can say that, uh, that uh, most countries, because of the Made in China model, that, uh, that the European country they do not need to produce the move to China. I went to China several times with Danish business delegations. Okay. So they need help. So at that time I was, read, I was uh, 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 in a junior position in the university, so I had some time to travel to China with Danish business people. And also deindustrialization de in, in the third world countries. That's also very interesting. Why? 
because China produce everything. China need material, need commodities. So for many countries in the third world, in the developing world, just sell their product or uh, commodities, raw materials to China, they allow money. Why would I have to produce? We don't have to produce. Because I just said, for example, Brazil and the Latin America, they have a, a decade of commodity boom. They don't need to produce anything. Simply sell their rubber, uh, you know, soybeans, meat, whatever, and report the product or raw material, coal, whatever. Okay? So you can see big, big industrialization from both the south and the north. Now, this is what we call the old model, made in China model. <coughs> what is the model today, since 2013, 14, five years ago, China moved to another model called the new growth model, where that uh, China wants to rebalance the economy, change it from exports co to consumption. China does not want to produce anymore. On the other hand, Chinese labor is getting too high, too expensive. So many countries have to move their production out. Even Chinese themselves also moving some of the industries out. Okay? From manufacturing to service, I just read data that uh, the percentage of contribution to GDP from uh, manufacturing fall from service increase. Okay. From importing to indigenous innovation, from surplus saving to saving absorption, especially moving from low, in a, uh, low technology to high technology. So China now is one of the key countries, key competitors to Western countries in terms of high technology. When China in the last 30 years was this model, this model is like a lady, okay, married with Western men, lady with Western men. It's very good marriage because it's a, it's a, a cheap, okay. The man does not have to pay a lot of uh, money for, for, for the marriage and also it's very hard working, produce a lot, make good products, make good babies, so the man is very happy. But now the wives are changing. The wife is changing, so now the man said, I want to divorce, but it's difficult to divorce. Okay. This is the United States. The US situation is that when the United States, when China produces everything, so the United States buy a lot of things, pay China a lot of dollars, and China become a global supplier, and, 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 and the United States said, Please buy our debt so I can buy all your product. Okay, China buy a lot of US debt, and US get a lot of cheap loan from China, and US does not even produce more. So you have one year, two year, three year, or 10, 15 years, something's wrong. Which, one, which part is wrong? Here is wrong. Because when China produces everything, sell it to the United States, and even lend money to the United States, so US can have a cheap loan and buy a lot of more from China, so US industry become empty. This is the, the model where the United States now realize is big mistake. You can see here, the US debt to China is 1.13 trillion dollar, and US trade deficit is, but in 2018, this is almost 500 billion, okay, deficit. So the Trump war, Trump think that uh, China buys too little, sell too much. This is the trade, actually this is not. The real trade war is just, I told you the story, okay. China is moving from traditional industry to a high tech industry, which China is competing with the United States in high tech. The United States has enjoyed this high tech dominance for decades. United States could not imagine any country is climbing to that position and is really threatening United States supremacy. This cannot be endured. So this is actually the real war. The other Trump just used trade, trade deficit as a weapon. It's very difficult. China used in the last 30 years 
which I realize China changed a lot. I, tra I travel to China almost three or four times a year. China is the country that used most money in infrastructures. And I feel that Chinese infrastructure is one of the best in the world. That's a, it's so easy to travel. A big country, billions of people, but so easy to travel, to travel around. It's because China used all the money in infrastructure, especially high speed, high speed trains. It's extremely effective. Okay. From Shanghai to Beijing, 1500 kilometers, a bit between four, four and five hours. It's a very efficient. And in China, and, and nobody uses money. Here in Italy, we use money a lot. In, Ch in China, if I lose my credit card, doesn't matter, forget it. If I lose my mobile, I'm dead. Immediately dead. I cannot <laughs> it. So the mobile phone, you have to protect it highly. Well. <laughs> Everything. You know, I went to the train and I want to buy a water or then the, the, the then the service people, the girl never come. I was very upset. I said the bad service. Then I went there, called the girl, I said to drive the car and you know the service the, the road will never come. She said, sorry, you have a you have a the code just beside on your armchair the code, ah QR code. You scan the code, you all everything will come to you. She thinks I'm stupid. Yes, I'm stupid. <laughs> then, then I try to scan it. I play very well. I can even order food. I want to eat 19 food, not Shanghai food. Then they order it. When train arrives in Nanjing, the food come. Really? I mean, I say, this is not a joke. This is really. What I'm saying is that uh, it's China is really changing a lot. And also, this is high-tech industries that China is getting really ahead of it. This is Alibaba's warehouse. You know, when you buy stuff, Alibaba has a big warehouse everywhere in China. These are the small computer, uh, 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 what? Some find, find the commodities for you. The new airport in China, Daxing Airport, I really recommend you should have a look. It's a robot parking. You just go there and uh, and uh, push pay, and the robots will park your car. You don't need to even wait. They, they, when you come, you can pay. Then your car will come out to you. It's just a very convenient. It's 5G. Uh, for me, holding a passport is not good. If the Chinese they have an ID card, they have no check at all because their face is face uh, recognition. Well, in Europe, a lot of debate. Because we want to, you know, have our privacy. We will not be exposed all the time. So, but the Chinese, they have different mentalities. The Chinese people, they love new technologies. Everything new, they rush. <laughs> if you see this, is my mobile phone is new. Are you sure this is new? It's good, and they just rush and buy it without even think. In Denmark, I told my colleague, this is a new telephone, very good. Are you sure? Do I need it? So, do I really need it? So the Westerners, they have a much more uh, resolutions. You can see by which all have a, not, I'm uh, sorry. Huawei, for example, has 5G put, uh, patent, 37%. This is one of the highest. Oh, yes. And also here, uh, in Shanghai, Yangshan port, if you, have, uh, if you have time, go there and have a look. This is a no man's port. No man. Everything is computer. Even the lorry, the truck, is automatic, come and load and drive away. This is a, a China has a two port called no man's port, of automation port. And also the recent book, if uh, anyone work on China's uh, technology competition with United States or with the Western country, this book is quite new, very good. It's called Tech Titans of China. It shows that China in the last just the last five, six years has achieved world level on um, all these, I do not need to go to, and also here. Very often, if you follow YouTube debate, the world is going to divide it into two systems. If United States China cannot make it win. In the future, we will have a Huawei today is producing uh, mobile phones without Google because Trump forbid Google to be installed in Huawei's uh, mobile. Imagine, imagine, 
if Chinese government does not allow uh, iPhone to use WeChat, WeChat is our is Chinese payment system, nobody is going to buy iPhone. Nobody. It's because WeChat is our life. WeChat is Chinese life. If you have no WeChat, then your life is dead in China. So you, you can see here, today in the West, you have Facebook, they have WeChat, they have Amazon, they have Alibaba, they have a Starbucks, they have a Rocky Coffee. Rocky Coffee is uh, such a uh, mobile. You sit home, suddenly you want coffee, you call, and within 10 minutes, of course, on the mobile, it shows how many times. Okay. If it's 10 minutes, if you wait 15 minutes, you don't pay. So those guys who, uh, who uh, uh, use this uh, you know, electronic uh, bicycle, they are very aggressive guys. Be careful. <laughs> they are very aggressive. They just, because they cannot afford losing the time. Yeah, they are very aggressive. And land bike, we have a mobile. So you can see in the world, we are going to have two systems. If US and China cannot, cannot uh, Make a group. And today, TikTok, you know, the TikTok, you, you can, you can move, you move, make your own movies. And TikTok is a, it's very popular today. And also, in China, you know, when I communicate with my colleagues, we, we always use email. I don't want to say use email, but in China, they don't like email. The professor did, don't you want to just use Because we should use everything. Even, even including payment and even including a tax document. Every situation, why, why you have to use, for example, these are alive, these are dead. And the Chinese, very few Chinese use PC today. They are, because their mobile phone is much more advanced today. They use everything on mobile phone. And the digital China, internet use, China has about uh, more than 800 million, and these are some kind of comparisons. Okay. And you can, you can see which is also only used in China, maybe a bit Western countries among Chinese communities, but you can see the number. If alone a country can compete with the whole world users, which has a huge market. And also you can see here that China's increasing catch up with the United States in terms of uh, in terms of patent application in terms of uh, R&D spending, in terms of academic papers, because US, China is really the catch up. That makes the United States very much worried. So they are beginning to very much control the flow of academics, the flow of students. And this is made in China 2025, don't forget, I talk about Made in China. Now, it's Made in China 20, 2025. This is a new slogan. I think that it was a mistake for the Chinese government to announce this slogan some years ago because that really catch the eye of the United States. It means that uh, the old Made in China model, where China in the center, you know, everything input, then produce, then export, Moving to a situation where China is going to be the dominant player in terms of all these high-tech industries. When the Chinese government announced this, it shocked the United States. Already you are much more competitive today. Now you want to be the dominant power. Think the United States feeling. They, they do not feel very well. And I think it's not good that China government use this kind of slogan. Uh, which really has uh, put other people in, in a nervous situation. And these are Chinese plans. Xi Jinping, he just announced Chinese dream. You know Chinese dream? So Trump, American dream. So Chinese dream, American dream today are in flesh. The Chinese dream is that uh, when China established uh, uh, 100 years, after 30 years, China will be return to the dominant power in the world. Today, we call the rise of China. Actually, many scholars, they do not like the rise of China. Many scholars actually use the return of China because China used to be the world power anyway, long before Europe, European powers. 
And here you can see this is the reason for, and also China's account for this. And Chinese, then what is China? China today, yes, China has still some traditional industries, but China, if you look at here, Fortune 500. United States has 126 companies. China alone has 120 companies listed, the global companies. Okay? It, it is predicted after a few years, China will surpass the United States. The largest bank in the world, the largest 10 banks in the world, the first four are Chinese banks. And also China is the largest export of high-tech commodities. Apart from automobile and airplane. Airplane and automobiles are still the monopoly, the monopoly of the European of Europe and the United States. But otherwise uh, China is the largest. Okay. So the debate is China is a developing country or not? China claimed itself a developing country. When I was in Latin America, when I when, whenever I mention China as a developing country, they laugh at me. Latin American country they laugh at me. They they laugh, they say. Are you sure, Professor Lee, that uh, China is, uh, is a developing country? And uh, Trump said that, uh, that if China is a developing country, everybody is a developing country. <laughs> okay. So that's a big debate. So far about impact on developing, on developing countries. But how about impact on developing countries? That China is the largest consumer of global resources. Within four years, I'll give you a surprising data. Within four years, China consumed cement, which is equivalent to the whole 20th century of the United States. See that? You know, the 20th century, which means that the US in the 20th century used cement. China in the four, five years used the same. China consumption of uh, is this channel's consumption of global of global resources huge where where do these resources come from not from China definitely from developing countries sorry you can see here this is Africa this is Latin America so the, today another debate is whether China is a new colonialism New imperialism. From data, it's difficult to say no. You know why? Because the definition of colonialism or imperialism is that a country always exports finished products, whereas import raw material from developing countries. This is the European country has been doing for more several hundred years. The Chinese trade data shows China exports. Almost more than 90% is fin uh, finished manufactured product import raw material. So in that sense, yes, China is repeating the colonial pattern. I know Chinese scholars they don't like to hear that. Uh, some of the Chinese scholars from from China they they are very to to call China an imperialist country. They don't like to hear. But I tell them that well, if you Stick to the definition, yes, we are. But on the other hand, of course, China also gives them a lot of opportunities, and we, we can discuss this, this African situation. Not only in hard power, China is catching also soft power. Several years ago, if we talk about Chinese soft power, nobody really cared. Everyone knows China is a big producer, China is power, but soft power is always Western power. Okay, but it's also changing. Why it changing? Because of the diffusion power of hard power. Okay. When you when you are success as an economic development model, even if because the Chinese government always say we do not want to export our model, the Chinese model is unique. It's historically, culturally unique only to us. Nobody can copy. I agree. Nobody can copy a single party authoritarian state model in China. Nobody can copy. But why? But then you have to have a you have to produce a situation where it's very similar to Chinese. Okay, which on the one hand is single party. Okay, it's no no 
Allah. No Allah party is allowed to compete by constitution. Second is that uh, it's authoritarian, it's centralized. Okay. So in most countries today, it's very difficult. Okay. So there are many debates about this. Anyway, that uh, even China does not want to export. Nevertheless, that the Chinese model is having great impact on uh, many developing countries. Today, Chicago School of Economics, they have a difficulty in teaching economic theories. Also in Novo University, one professor told me when he, when he was teaching about economic theories, about supply, demand, currency, this and that, he was interrupted by, by students all the time. Professor, I'm sorry, China is not like that. So a lot of economic theories is in a difficult situation to, to, to teach. Whether China is establishing its own system, this is a, a, this is a, a, a question that Europe cares about. This is the question that we, which the United States cares about. Okay. Is China is establishing an international system with Chinese characteristics? Yes or no? If I say no, China is not having that ambition, but the reality is difficult to deny. Okay. If you look at here, the, the BRICS is China dominant organization. The Shanghai organization is China dominant organization. It's like NATO, like NATO. Okay. And the one bad one rule I'm going to take, tell you, China dominant. Uh, the the Shanghai organization today, there are <coughs> Israel is applying, Saudi is applying. It's getting larger and larger. The Shanghai organization, okay. And also we have a China dominant brings, especially here, Asian financial, sorry, Asian infrastructure investment bank. Italy is a, is a member, I know that, and also Safe World Foundation. These look like, like IMF and World Bank. These are like European Union and also NATO. So if you say China is not uh, is not creating a, a world order with Chinese terrorists, that's not true. It is actually. Even though the Chinese government does not think so. Chancellor Merkel, she said very clearly, Last year in the Econo uh, World Economic Forum, he said that the, the West is too slow to reform. He said the fact that there is now an Asian investment, investment bank alongside the existing G20 format, the World Bank, the fact that there is also Shanghai organization which brings together China, India, Russia, the, 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 the fact that China is promoting 6 plus 1 format. Work, the, 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 the. You know why? It's because in the West we are too slow to reform in national order. China cannot wait anymore. China used to be the follower of the international system, but today China said, well, that I cannot be only the follower anymore. I want to be a rule maker. That's the possible problem. Okay. For example, IMF, if you look at the United States economy is, is 90.2. Voting power, United States has 16.8. China's economic size is 16.1, but China's voting power is only 3.8. If, we if you were Chinese leaders, what did you say? Is it fair picture? No, not, not the, today it's about 6% because it increased. Okay. Now Chinese yuan is also part of AMEF. Uh, Special withdrawal basket, which means these are the major global currencies that central bank can borrow. This has nothing to do with our daily life. Okay, this is for the central bank. Chinese yuan, since several years ago, become a major currency that Italy can borrow. Any country can borrow. You don't have to borrow a dollar. You don't have to borrow a euro if you don't want. Okay. So China, Chinese yuan, the, so China become part of the global rule maker already. Gradually, okay. And also, one by one rule. Now, this is interesting. That um, Makinda, how uh, Makinda? If you study in relation, the term geopolitics. I know that you use geopolitics in geoeconomics. Don't forget geopolitics. The word was invented by Makinda in the 19th century. He has. He had a map. The map. 
if you open the world map, in the middle is the Europe and Asia, Euro and Euro Asia. He said, this is the heart of the world. This is the heart of the world. The rest, North America, South America, Africa, they are not important. The most important is the Euro-Asia region. That's the heart. Okay. Who controls this heart? Who controls the world? Okay. So, China's one bad, one road is exactly is trying to link Europe and China across the region. So according to in large relation, the new literature, China actually is exactly trying to be the dominant power of this hot region. Okay. And this is a one bad one road. Today, regularly there are two lines of trains, cargo train, not yet uh, a passenger train. From London to China, from Madrid to China, okay, uh, cargo train. I came to Denmark in 88, 32 years ago. At that time, I was a young man. I didn't have any money. At that time, China was already very poor. I could not afford plane ticket, so I took train. I took eight days, seven nights, from Beijing all the way to Mongolia, Russia, then to East Berlin and all this. So, during the Cold War period, I'm, I'm quite convinced in a couple of years there will be passenger trains from Europe to China through the Siberia route. That would be very interesting. I recommend forget the plane, take the train. Yeah, and listen. You can off, off, on, off, on. I think it will be. It will be. Oh, yes. And also here. One by other one road is going to link China, Africa, China, Europe. Where is the United States? <laughs> if you were in the United States, what's your mind? You get very upset, angry. Definitely. So the United States called one by other one road evil project. <laughs> yes, it's called the evil project. So this is the, the, the point. Okay. It's also their own fault because they do not want to join. Today, about 128 countries signed document, and Italy signed as well, recently, only recently. And what is the Europe religion with, with China? Now I move to the next, the final point. What is the Europe China policy? Extremely divided according to my analysis. It's like here. Every country is negotiating with China on their own terms. Italy recently joined. Italy is one of the only countries of the G7 that signed cooperation documents on one by the one road. And the United States was so upset. The United States sold Italy. Okay. Well, Italy said, well, that, <laughs> this is our national interest. So you can see Italy is it's very interesting, okay. How about, how about Huawei? If you look at this, style, this map, Europe is totally, totally divided. Eastern European countries, they, they are not disobey the United States. Okay, this is okay. So most Eastern European countries, okay, I'm not going to use. UK, no. UK say no, I, I cannot because that Huawei is quite effective. Germany also say no to the United States. Okay. Um, and Denmark also say yes to the United States. Denmark is too small. Okay. So you can see Europe is totally divided. And in Europe, at the political term, we have a EU and China yearly conference, a government conference. At the same time, China has another conference with 17 plus one. 17 countries in Eastern Central European countries. Used to be 16. Why 17? Greece. Yes, Greece recently joined. And the Chinese president was, uh, was in Greece uh, seven days ago. So you can see here that, uh, and whether Europe, that does Europe have a, a, a similar understanding on the rise of China? My colleague told me in Denmark that Danish government recently said China's rise is systematic challenge. It's system, systemic challenge. 
Do you know systemic change? What does that mean? Systemic change, which means that a challenge that has an implication on world order. System, which means that the, the challenge has an implication on the system. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. Okay, but whether EU has the same policy, I don't know. And now we have a three big power: EU, US, China. The three biggest economic partners. They are in disagreement. Okay, some of them. Okay. Then we can have a full power if we cross Russia. Okay. And China and Russia is increasing become a strategic partnership. This is the situation where the West say this the this is the nightmare. Because Kissinger, if you know Harry Kissinger, the U.S. Uh, strategic scholars and uh, the, the previous uh, State of Secretary, he said that uh, for a long period of time, the United States and the West is able to keep relatively stable relations with either China or Russia, but keep Russia and China hate each other, be hostile to each other. That's also true for many, many decades. China was very suspicious to Russia. Russia was very suspicious to China, also because of historical reasons as well. But now the two countries become much more strategic partnership because they have the same interest, because they are facing the same threat from the West as well. So this is a nightmare to, according to international politics. Okay. Now, my my last. Slides is also for the slides for discussions, questions. It's when we study time relations, we always have to reflect theories. Okay? So we have different theories. We have realist theories, we have liberal theories, we have constructed theories, we have critical theories. Now, if we you think if you keep these theories in mind and look at these are relationships, you have the US, you have the EU, and also other uh, middle 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 powers. You have China, Russia, and break uh, the BRICS. You have the US here. Now, traditionally it's a long alliance. Traditionally, this is a rivalry. But how about here? How about today here? EU and China. I don't know. I put dot. It's because I want to ask you. Okay, whether it's a rivalry, whether it's alliance. Yes, alliance in terms of that the US is behaving not behaving well. So you will find some common ground with China. But not in alliance, because EU and China also have a lot of things uncommon as well. So and also a better road, the project here. So I end here and I simply put questions here so we can have a debate. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor. And now, as usual, the floor is yours. It's open to your questions and comments. Okay, there is one question there. Yes, uh, I'm Gregor from France. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, you presented the China as uh, developed countries, and uh, I wanted to know uh, what do you think about the 39 uh, there found in the country there in the United Kingdom, uh, Chinese the national debt in this country now. Uh, why do you think they, they escape China to join the European Western country? Uh, if China is uh, really developed. Oh my God, that, uh, <laughs> that CN didn't, didn't apologize. CN misreported. It was Vietnamese. Did you, so this was not clear. If you go to Google again, 
that the, 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 the CN, the Chinese foreign ministry scold CN. You know, you know, Trump said CNN is a, is, a, is a liar, it's a fake news producer. I have to say that on that issue, it's a fake news producer. That uh, it is, uh, uh, they were a bad news. It was already clear. So you could go to Google and check the news again. It, because that was automatic. That uh, for a long time, that uh, the Western perception of China is a country where people, you know, have to escape, Little really distance travel escape, politics, etc. Et That's not the case anymore, I believe. Okay, so when that issue took up, that 38 dog, dead bodies from from the the truck, immediately, automatically, the CNN said that uh, CNN even questioned the same question. CNN raised to the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs daily uh, press conference, and it was immediately. Uh, kept by the, the British new source where that the 39 were Vietnamese. And the Vietnamese uh, government also protested against the UK for hiding information, for hiding. I, I can't remember what is the protection about, but you can check. So unfortunately today it's, it's not the right news. This is again shows the bias and impression. Okay. Hello, um, thank you for your lesson. I'm an uh, Italian student. Um, what do you think about uh, replacement technology to work? And uh, is it possible to consider the technology as an uh, exogenous um, ex uh, variable? Uh, to introduce a new technology. Uh, your question is about uh, the technology. Yeah. How should we trade technology? Um, I think the debate today and is the workers. That, uh, and, and the workers. Sorry. Uh, what? Uh, the relation about uh, technology and uh, workers and uh, uh, workers, not uh, workers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which means that technology is. Replacing yeah. the workers. Uh, if possible, um, technology uh, can change the, the level low in, uh, in our uh, um, structure about uh, um, low. I'm not clear about this. Can you reformulate the question? Growth of technology is just making people's importance minor, mm. and can this affect the labor level? Yes, definitely. That's a very good question. Um, the question of technology being used or uh, developed uh, in China has become a very controversial debate today. Uh, many of the Chinese uh, uh, technologists, especially the facial recognition, there was a story that uh, in Hangzhou area, Alibaba area, there was a big, uh, you know, uh, what is called the rock music uh, public performance. There are 30,000, 40,000 people. And they even identified one criminal. And he was captured. Because he disappeared. Okay. And also, technology also can be used, for example, in Hong Kong, even they use masks. They say that the technology, the facial technology, they can they use the dog system, they can the computer system, that they can follow your face, your face uh, shape. They still can trace you. So in that sense, it's, it's another debate. The, another debate is the workers. Okay, that uh, workers actually are losing their their, their their security and labor union. But this is uh, what we have been discussing in international political comment as well that the bargaining chips of labor become lower and lower because of the mobility of capital and because of the technology owned by the capital. So they are in a high uh, position than labor. Labor used to be, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, in a contradiction, fight their uh, rights with capital. But today, labor is in a uh, lower status 
in, in their bargaining chips with capital because capital has technology today. So this is a very crucial, really very crucial age. So the discussion about um, all the new technologies, AI, for example today, once you have mobile, where you are, everybody knows, not me, I cannot know, but Italian security, they know where you are. As long as your mobile is open. Michael, Michael, wait, wait okay, for the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Let's first. Okay, let's first. Oh, he's a gentleman. <laughs> um, I was curious because um, I was wondering if there is any um, social protection for the workers uh, in um, in terms of uh, labor law or something or. How it's uh, regulated? In the last uh, 30 years, in the beginning, to be honest with you, that uh, why global capital moved to China? Tell me, why they moved to China? They want the money. And also because the social protection was very low. was very low. Yeah, but today. Oh, yeah. Today, uh, today uh, is that uh, it's a. Uh, it's, uh, if you get if it's getting higher, but if you're getting higher, the capital think that you are not cheap anymore. So they move away. That's a contradiction. As a capital, capitalism is a not moral system. You should not uh, talk about capitalism with morality. That's two things. It's, uh, it's, uh, capitalism is, is, is a system for for profit and capital accumulation. It's not so if you are talking about moral standards, labor rights on this with capitalism, well, it's only if you have a strong union, or if only that uh, that uh, in Europe, I mean, the European Union has quite a high uh, standard, but China still needs to do much more in terms of social protection. But social protection is getting better. Previously, many years ago, in China, uh, that uh, the Chinese government wants to have two kids now. They used to have a one-child system. Nobody wants to have two kids because it's too expensive. Too expensive that uh, my mother went to the hospital just to have a one, one uh, injection. Uh, her uh, pension, half, half month pension is gone. You understand? Half month, half month pension is gone because of one injection. So you can see, but now, because in the beginning, uh, in order to pursue economic benefits, in order to catch up with the West, China only think about capital, capital, economic growth, economic growth. They forget all these social welfare, social uh, institutions. Uh, and now, if you do not do that, people will revolt. And your legitimacy, your ruling legitimacy, it will be in crisis. So today, actually, it's much better that the uh, maximum for every Chinese pay 80%, uh, sorry, 20%. That the government cover 80% if you go to the hospital. Anything, okay. My mother got operation uh, several months ago that she paid 20%. So it's, it's much better. So it, it's improving gradually. But in the 1980s, in the 1990s, it was very harsh. It was very harsh. It's, a, it's like a primitive capitalism. So China is developing a welfare system? Yes. It had socialist welfare system, actually. But because economic reform thought socialism was not good, so actually they destroyed every social systems, social welfare systems during the socialist period. Because that, uh, the government said to the workers, you know, one day, China, one day in 1980, in 1986, 87, I can't remember, just one day the government says, we cannot afford workers anymore. So let me give you a number, about 20 or 25 million workers Awkward. without anything, without anything. You know who absorbed this problem? Tell me, who? If a government announced 20 million people out of a job, who absorbed absorb this problem? Luckily, that, that culture is very strong in China, in East Asia. When you have a problem, where do you go? You go to your parents. It was your family. Italy has a strong, strong, strong China, family. China too. 
So the Chinese family tradition absorbed all the problems. So we are lucky that if China were as a, you know, basically an American system or, or other systems without strong family roots, this country will be already in revolution. Already in revolution. Yes? Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm Francesco Murgo from the University of Turin. Thank you for your lecture. It was very nice to listen to. Um, if we give a look at the 17 plus one, plus one uh, forum map, it seems like there's the, the creation of a Soviet Union bloc, once again, with a Russia, of course. So we can say that the, the Europe is once again broken between East and West. So, what I would like to ask you is, do you think that for China it's better to cooperate with a broken Europe or with a unified Europe? That is a very critical question. That's very good. I like it. I like it very much. Okay. Eastern Europe is your baby. Like I, uh, once I was asked uh, in, in one of the debates, you know, I was putting debate with others. And uh, they think in a similar way they talk about East China Africa. I will come back to this China Africa, China Africa. China new imperialism, new colonialism, all this. That's fine. Then I said uh, to uh, a lady from Germany, she's very tough, she was very. Then I said, she was a kind of uh, policymaker in, in Berlin. Then I asked her that uh, how many years the China relationship, economic relationship between China and Africa, how many years? Roughly 15, 15 years. Okay, 15, 20 years. During the socialist period, during the Cold War, China's relationship with Africa was very political because it's a socialist uh, revolutionary support. Okay. Then I said that uh, China's relationship with Africa 15 years. How many years you, Europe, have relation with Africa? How many years? 400 years? 300 years? At least Africa have been your babies. Babies means not, not in a sarcastic way. Babies means it's your backyard, it's your babies, it's your sphere of interest. Okay? If you have done a good job, if you have done a good job, can China play any role? No. It's because you play a bad job, Eastern Europe is Western Europe baby. It's your backyard. If you have done a good job, why are they with China? So, so the point first is that your immediately that colony, the Cold War colony, I think is a bit out of all, uh, out of date, not out of order, sorry, out of date. It's, it's older, definitely. But it's out of date in a way that uh, it's in a globalized world today, that national interest is not defined in terms of political ideology anymore. It's very rare. It's in terms of economic interest. So, if you immediately use Cold War division, then it's become ideology. Okay. So I, I think that framework is a bit out of date. Okay. On the other hand, that the um, EU has tremendous. It's not EU to cope with EU is not is not an easy job. EU has tremendous rule of games, a lot of regulation. Oh, and uh, and uh, and you never ever had uh, common voices. Very difficult to have have common voices. So many Chinese delegations. When I was in China, I asked Chinese delegations, Chinese, Chinese diplomat, Chinese policymakers, they said to me, "Well, if you want to reach agreement with the European Union, it's very difficult. Oh, all kind of voices. You don't know what. They, but relatively, it's easier to work with Eastern European countries because they need." The investment, and also because that they begin to think the Chinese model, the success of Chinese model, has great impact on Eastern Europe, not so much on Western Europe, because Western Europe is already a success model. And uh, in, in my book, One Bad One Road book, one chapter written by a Polish uh, uh, researcher, he used the word called diff non diffusion, policy diffusion. He said the Chinese success and also the way China makes plans, the way Chinese policymakers design their policies, 
implemented had tremendous impact on Polish policy makers. So that's why I'm saying that whether China wants or not wants, Chinese success model would have this diffusion effect. So I think that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not much, but European Union uh, is very much worried about China's 70 plus one. And I think that the challenge to China is that how to cooperate with these countries by following a uh, kind of standards which which European Union can accept. This is the challenge. But not in terms of Cold War line, this kind of uh, I, I think in that way, I think the Europe, European Union will be satisfied. Uh, I think it's based on the norms, the norms, international norms that the European Union is very strict to. I, I agree with that, actually. Good evening, Professor. My name is Ruben Francesco, and I'm a student of uh, Professor Vincent's class. And uh, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, on The Economist, uh, something like one week ago, it appeared in uh, an article uh, talking about the uh, Stockholm Forum, China Forum, uh, I think it was last, last week, and uh, which said uh, China, West is now, uh, is now aware that China is not going to liberalize. Uh, so my question is, um, don't China think that the vision that uh, West, especially West, Western countries have over the uh, rise of China uh, is affected by its uh, authoritarianism, uh, capitalism? And uh, don't uh, China think that uh, a reform, a political reform, uh, could affect positively um, the relationship and even China itself. Mm -hmm. In 1989, um, the big event uh, that the Berlin Wall, uh, Berlin Wall collected in 1919, which event trade Eastern European Revolution? That was, that was 1989, the Chinese student movement in Beijing. Okay. China actually started first pro-Western democracies. China started first. But it was spread down where Eastern Europe took over. Then first, uh, you know, uh, in Romania, then uh, the Berlin Wall collapsed gradually. Then Russia moved to democracy overnight. Yeltsin even announced Russian Communist Party was illegal. And many Generals, many old people, old generation in Russia, they even committed suicide because they could not. If, if I told my ma father, my father joined the communist army when he was 14 years old. He was an army officer. If I told my father that the communist party in China now is Ill illegal, I just doubt that he would commit suicide as well. You cannot allow such a situation that people fight his whole life. So what I mean is Russia went too fast from one to another extreme. But China, even though that the Tiananmen Square was suppressed, that was a big debate still, I believe that there will be a historical assessment in the future. I, I believe, but not now. So Chinese strategy was, Deng Xiaoping's strategy was let, let us work hard and achieve something. Let us not engage in ideological, ideological all these value debates. Socialism, political reform, democracy, let's forget it. He said, whether cat is black or white, doesn't matter, as long as cat catches a mouse. Okay? That is his uh, pragmatic expression. So the Chinese in the last 40 years never engaged in ideological debates, never made any substantial political reform, as you talk about. But China had achieved words recognized economic achievement. From one of the poorest countries 40 years ago to the second largest economy today, within 40 seconds, fourth decade, but was not achieved in line with the modernization theory. Have you studied modernization theory? Modernization, the Western projection. The China threat today, let me tell you, the China threat, 
Okay, why, why China threat? It's because the Chinese development is totally against the perceived perception, the perceived logical progression seen in the Western mind. That is, when economic growth started, economic development will create plural society. Plural society will create multiple civil, civil society NGOs. Multiple civil society NGOs will create multiple parties. Multiple parties will engage in debate, in, 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 in competition, democracy, multi-party democracy will emerge. That is your tradition. That is the Western tradition. But that was not in China. So the dilemma today is that why? Okay. Why? That uh, authoritarian states in the last 20, 20 years produced wealth that's much better than democratic states. That is a very hard fact for Western countries to accept. And also, the Western country, they really think that China needs to have economic reform. But don't you understand the Chinese Communist Party is not a stupid. They understand they have only one party. They understand they have legitimacy problems. So they do not have economic reform, but they have a lot of, every day they have, they have political modifications. They do not have reform, they have modifications. I can promise you the Chinese state cares about people's life more than the democratic state. I can give you a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, because they are so react and responsive to the people's voice. If something wrong, they will have problems. My mother worked as uh, the bottom uh, civil, uh, social kind of, you know, in China, people live in a compound, okay, high buildings compound. My mother worked as a, a kind of the lowest, uh, in Chinese, the director of that residential compound. She worked as a, a director. And you know what, what she was doing? If a, if a couple, you know, uh, conflict, divorce, and it came to my mother, he treated me badly, I want to divorce him. My mother said, oh, come on, sit down, see you. So, yeah. so she deal a lot of this kind of a social conflict. And every month she attended meeting, and she has to report that what has been happening among communities. So, that, and she reports to the high committee, the high committee reports to the high committee. So they have a systematic committees. They are actually hear what people think. Listen what people are talking And if a social event, a struggle, let's say a revolution starts in some part of China, the mayor, the provincial governor will be dismissed immediately because you failed to listen to people's voice, listen to uh, uh, prepare what happened. So the Chinese government, because of the limitations, they do not have a they do not have a multi-party system like you. They do not have a, 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 a independent and also autonomous media that can watch things for you. That's why they need to install a lot of mechanisms which make Chinese Communist Party very much, you know, resilient, responsive. And that is recognized by your reunion. I was in a major conference, many major conference. There is a consensus that the Chinese Communist Party, even though it's authoritarian on the one side, but it's very resilient, very responsive, very, very watchful to people's daily life. You try to find some data, let me give you some data. IPSO episodes in England, and also Pew, PW, public opinions, and also Gallup, public opinions. Try to get some data. Which country has highest approval of their government? 83%. Highest China. That is not Chinese data. That is not Chinese data. That is British data. 
PEW, that is American data. Which country has the, which country's youth have the highest confidence in their future? China. So we have to be critical towards China. I totally agree. On the other hand, we should not be dogmatic, claiming that the Communist Party by definition is bad. Communist Party or the authoritarian state by definition is uh, is it can be outcompeted by Western democracies. That is not the case, unfortunately, because I am invited by Chinese universities three times, four times a year. They want to listen to me. What happened in the West? What is the West opinion? What is the Western analysis? Okay. What and, and I was also contacted by I was invited by mayor, Chinese mayor sometimes. They even asked me that uh, that uh, I should give them some lectures. Lecture like today, is, of course I will conduct a different style. I will not speak in the same way as I speak to you. They are very curious. They are very minded. So I just want you to understand that yes, we should be critical towards human rights standards, democratic uh, uh, standards in China. We need to really that, uh, encourage the Chinese to be more updating with the world standard. On the other hand, we should not be documented. That is not good. That will really be distorted by the reality. Yeah. So there is, we have, uh, I think, 17 seconds. And, but there, there is still um, a, a question from Carolina from Brazil. Yeah. I'll try to be as brief as possible. My name is Carolina from Brazil. Um, I, I was wondering specifically about three main points. First of all, um, how do you feel that the, the, the alliance, the attempt of alliance between Bolsonaro and Trump is going to affect Brazil's and China's relationship, especially now with the, with the creation of the BRICS, BRICS Bank? I also have a, a concern about how is China's uh, possible policies for reduction of CO2 emission? What was the issue? CO2. CO2. Yeah, uh, since the, the, the Treaty of Paris and because of China's development, it has risen a lot in the, the, the past decades. And also, um, how is China's stance towards human rights now? And I'm not talking about politics, I'm talking about um, the recent reports on the Xinjiang region of the Muslim minority, which is, has been kept in camps, has been uh, happening a cultural genocide. Okay, I think okay. that's extremely important. Uh, when Bolsonaro was in campaign, uh, when Bolsonaro was in campaign, he said something which shocked the Chinese. He said China is not buying Brazil commodities. China is buying Brazil. That shocked Chinese. Uh, and uh, the Chinese perception was that he was very rational. He was very pro Trump. But he's changing. Uh, he was in China to meet the Chinese president one, one week after they, they met again in, in Brazil. And that was very. He went to the United States and he talked with Trump. He was other good friend, etc. Well, Trump doesn't. Trump didn't take him seriously and he was very upset. And he. Before he left the United States, he announced that he is going to China. It's he committed on purpose. Brazil was much stronger than China 20 years ago. I had data. Brazil was much more industrial, advanced, economic, and also uh, uh, many other aspects 20 years ago. But 20 years later, it was such an unfortunate situation that when I was in Brazil, I already talked about it. Brazil is becoming a Chinese supplier of commodities. Very unfortunate. Um, and also that uh, even though the Brazil enjoy a decade of the commodity boom, but uh, it becomes such as uh, when Chinese purchase of commodity is getting high, then the, the GDP growth is getting high in the region, including Brazil. When Chinese decline, now declined, okay, and, and then the region suffered. And now uh, China buys a lot of Brazil soya beans. You know why? Because Trump 
Okay, and China say, oh, hey, you give me sanctions, I buy from others. So China-Brazil relations is a, is a, is a very interesting. Uh, uh, Brazil was not was also very upset with China on other issues like the permanent membership of Security Council. Brazil wants to be member, and, and China said, well, if I say yes to you, I have to say yes to India, to Japan, no. Japan, no. No way, Japan. So, and it was also a bad strategy that Japan, uh, Brazil, Germany, India, four big alliance in applying for security membership. And you never, uh, the big four countries, immediately. So it was not sufficient. And also, I was in Brazil in March. I was invited by Brazil Army College, by Brazil Navy College, the two military institutions. When I talked to the uh, rector of Army, uh, college, Army College, a colonel, he gave me a suit, and he said, I said, well, for Bolsonaro, it made Chinese very nervous. He said, well, please don't worry. We military, we have a very good relations with China. And we are not going to let, let our new president destroy this relationship. We have already sent someone to give him some whisper that uh, he should be careful that our strategic interest is dependent on China. He, when he mentioned it, it's in strategic commodities, export commodities, it's only China is buying, so you do not destroy that. And on, on the CO2, I think that now China is left alone. Trump withdraw from Paris. Paris. Yeah. China. I think it's Chinese interest to continue. If you look at the Chinese capital Beijing, 10 years ago, many people move out because the uh, smoke. And today, if you, if you went to China, major cities they become much better because of the people. And because of the authoritarian regime, when Chinese authoritarian decision, you must intervene. So that is a good part of authoritarianism, that when something is wrong, you can implement policy very effectively. Okay, so that, that is, uh, that is uh, my, my answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.